Hello everyone and welcome to our Tech Tuesday Tutorials number 180. Today we show you how to make your own custom Google Maps using Google My Maps. Google's My Maps has been around for years, but not many people talk about it or even know about it. It doesn't help that Google Maps doesn't even link to My Maps, and Google doesn't include it in the waffle of applications. My Maps is actually separate from Google Maps, even though they have a lot of the same resources. So why would you want to use My Maps? Well, sometimes you may want to map your own custom pins for things like lesson plans or your own custom resources. Or maybe you're planning or documenting a trip or even an aid to help teach history. So how do you get there? You can access it by going to mymaps.google.com. You'll be greeted by the landing page and My Maps interface is pretty easy to learn even for newbies. Anyways, any maps that you've created will be listed right there and it, they're categorized by all, owned, not owned, shared, and recent. To create a new map, you simply go over here and hit the big red button that says create new map. One thing you should note is that you do have the stacks menu up here at the top. That lets you create a new map as well as the big red button, but you can also go to the help and provide feedback and even access Google Drive here. It's kind of a weird link to have in the maps application, but the reason is that these map files are actually stored in your Google Drive. Okay, so let's click on create a new map and let's make a new map. When you get here, you'll see three major sections. The layers box over here on the left, the search bar at the top, and the map tools bar underneath that. First step is to name your map. So you go in here and give it a name. We'll just call ours test two, and you can give a description if you like or not. Once you get your name, you can start adding components to this. We'll call them either pins, markers, or locations. You can add them straightforward just by clicking add marker and then clicking where you would like it to be. But that's a little imprecise. I'm gonna cancel that and delete that. The other more effective way is to type in the location, either a known name for something or a street address. We're gonna go ahead and just type in the name. So we put in first to Teresa. You'll see some information coming from Google Maps and you have one option here and that's to add it to your map. When you do so, you'll get a little place marker over here under the current layer. By the way, you can name your layers just like you named your map. Click on the name and give it a name. So you can continue to add additional ones here. Find the items you want, add them to the map and continue on doing this for as long as you need to. I can continue to put in all the different resources for the state. I can zoom out using the wheel on my mouse like I normally would, or even hitting the buttons down below. And you can start seeing these pins pop up. I can turn this layer on or off and it turns on or off all the items within the layer. I cannot individually turn the items on or off. I have to do it by the layer. So that is important to know. You can create more layers if you like to be able to further segment your item. Now, each of these layers contains information. This information is generally the name and the description, but you can add more bits of data. Now, this data here is not actually part of our data table that is associated with this layer. It's pulled from Google Maps. But if I'd like to hard code more information in here, let's say the director of the Reese's, then I can do that. You can edit any of these place markers just by hitting the pencil icon, and you can see where I can change those. Currently, it's name and description fields. That's it. So if I want to add more columns, I can go over here to the layer options, hit the three dots, open the data table, and I'll have a temporary window that pops up there showing the data that is currently associated with these things, name, description. I don't have any other column. Well, let's add another one. I can go to any column here and pull down the little drop down menu next to it and choose to insert a column before or after. I'll choose after, and I'll call this one director. So let's say I wanted to actually track the director of each of these Reese's. That's something that does not come from Google Maps and I may have to hard code. So I'll come in here, I can double click and put in the values. Okay, so once I've put those into there, they're now part of the table, I can close that out. And whenever I click on these, you'll see that that description field is now there and the director is now there. I can edit this and if I don't want the description field to be there anymore, I just uncheck it. If you uncheck any of these additional fields, they do uncheck for all items that you show from then on. If there's only one item, it doesn't actually show the label for that. It only shows the label if there are two or more items there, and then you'll see the label. You can continue to add more fields as you like if you'd like to record more information that doesn't automatically come from Google Maps, or if you'd like to hard code that in there for some reason, like the phone number, you may put the phone number to the director rather than to the reset itself. You may include other fields like email or checkboxes even, doesn't really matter. Now, they all look about the same here, um, and that's something important to understand. You can style these. You'll see a paintbrush icon over here at the top, 
And right now they're currently using individual styles. That means I can override any one of these by just hovering over the item and choosing a different color. And I can assign a different style to, the, to each one of these entries. Now, if you've got 100 items, that's going to be annoying. So you may want to choose automatic styling. And right now it's set to individual, which overrides automatic. But I can change this to uniform style, in which case all of them have the same style and they're grouped by all the items. And I can give them all one color if I want. The other options here are sequence of numbers, in which case I can assign a color just like before, but they all use the same color and they just get a different number as they ascend uh, down the list. Or I can come over here and choose individual styles, which was there before, or style by data column. If I style by data column, then it assigns a unique color based on the values of the column. So let's try that. Let's say I wanted to add additional schools here. And I wanted to do it based on county, not necessarily based on RISA. I can come in here and choose to add a layer because I'd like to have a different layer that I can toggle and I want it organized by county. And this one might be called schools. So then I'm going to ignore that import for now. I'm just going to go in there and start searching for schools. I'll get Statesboro High School. I'll add that to the map. I'll also get Southeast Bullock Middle School. Add that to the map. And let's do... Um, Claxton Elementary School and Metter High School. Now for each one of these, uh, it's just pulled in that information. It does not show the director because that's a different table, a different layer, remember. So if I come here and look at this table, I'll notice it's reset to just name and description. I can add another column afterwards and let's call that column district. And it's a text column. So Statesboro High School is part of Bullock County. And so is Southeast Bullock High School, obviously. Claxton is part of Evans County. And Metter is part of Candler. Okay, great. So now you can see that they've got that district on there. And if I want to, I can style by district. And so each item there has a different color, as I zoom out, based on the district. I can turn off the Reese's, and you can see that these share the same color. If I want to make it more obvious, Bullock, let's assign a nice orange color to that. And you can see the differences there. And you'll also see the Bullock has two items within it. At any time, you can preview your map by clicking on preview and see what it looks like to someone who may not be logged in and see how it behaves. So they can expand just by clicking on this little chiclet and they can turn on and off different layers. If they click on it, it'll show more details over here. It looks different than your pop-up in your editing mode. And you can see your custom fields as well as any information from Google Maps. So at any time, you can go in here and edit this list, edit this map, and build more custom pins as you like. At some point, you may want to share this out to people. So you just hit on the share button at the top here. And the default setting is just to toggle whether or not you share anyone with the link can view it, or if you want to make it public so people can search for it on the internet. Most of the time for education, we don't want to check that box. We just want to say anyone with the link can view. This is not a fellow editor. This is just if you want to push this out and have anyone be able to view it just by you sharing the link. So you copy that link and you put that in an email or on a website or anything else you want to do. Now, if you need collaborators or you want fine tuned control over that, you can go and click on share on drive. And that brings up a very familiar drive sharing access, which you can then go in there and change it any way you like and have full control and add certain people to be editors and certain people to be viewers only or restrict it to anyone within your organization, any way you want to do it. But most of the time, you simply need to come over here and turn on anyone with the link can view when you're ready, copy that link, and then any changes you make will be live with that link. And so now for a bonus tip. What if you have a lot of data and maybe you're even getting data from a Google form like this? This is a simple form where we were asking participants to give their name, what place they would like to go on vacation, a little bit about that, how many years they've been teaching and what grade levels they teach. You could have 15 different entries or you can have 5,000 entries. And so what if you wanted to map all that? Well, that might take a long time if you were to do it manually within Google Maps. Um, you get better control when you do it manually but that importability is really good. And you may have had a keen eye and seen that import when we were working on it before. So let's just call this vacation. Um, and I would like to import a layer here and I'll just call this uh, places and I'm gonna choose import. So I'll come in here and import. I can either upload a file if I have the file in CSV or Excel format, or I can go to Google Drive and I can search for that. And we're gonna import this demo and say insert. Now what it's gonna do is it's gonna read all the different headers and it's gonna say which headers do you want to bring in and which one is going to be the position for your place marks. When they say position, they say, this is where we find out where to put the pin. You might think that the name would be the case, but no, in this case, the name is the name of the person. Vacation spot is what I wanna to use to determine the location of the pin. Then I'll continue. 
Then choose a column to title your markers. Well, what's going to be the name of the markers? Well, I could make it the same thing, the vacation spot, or I can actually name it based on the person who did that, and that becomes the name of the pin. Okay, let's try that and see what that looks like. Then I hit finish. Everything else gets brought in as an additional field. So you'll notice all these got brought in and I've got different markers here and they're all uniform style. Well, let's change that and let's make that into uh, based on the vacation spot. And so now you can see all the different vacation spots here or grade levels here. And if I do grade levels, you'll see that it now groups them. There are seven K5s and there are four nine to 12s and two six to eights. And if I preview this, then you can see that I can expand and get the names of the people because I chose that the name of the position was based on the name of the person filling out the form. And this is where they want to go and hear all the different things here. Now I can hit edit and I can say, I don't want timestamp. That came from the Google form. I don't want that to appear. And the rest of that I'll keep. Great. Okay, so I hope you all enjoyed this video. I hope you found it useful. And if you did, go ahead and hit that like button. Heck, why not support us and click that subscribe button and hit that bell icon to receive email notifications whenever we post an update. Leave a comment or an idea for a Tech Tuesday video below. Share this video with your friends and we'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.